right? Hey, you can grab your Bible. You can see we're in the book of Galatians. Again, if you're a guest, we're so glad you're here. We hope you've already felt loved into this place. God is doing an amazing work in our church in these days. And it's great to see you. I saw something this week uh, that caught my eye. I get my, I get my news from a lot of places. Um, and uh, one of those, I, I follow every now and then, it's the daily. It's just a 20, 25 minute uh, kind of podcast. And uh, one that caught my eye, uh, some of you know, my love for theology, of course, and philosophy and all things uh, apologetics and such. So the title of this little, little piece was called um, Cosmic Questions. I thought, ooh, cosmic questions. Let's see what we have to say here. So it was an interview, it was a conversation with a guy named Dennis Overby that I've never heard of, who is the cosmic affairs uh, correspondent for the New York Times. He's the cosmic correspondent for the New York Times. So I thought, well, that's an interesting job. And he explained, he's a, I had to look him up. He's a guy that is a, a real smart guy, physics degree from MIT. He has a master's degree from UCLA in astronomy. And he explained that his job is all about all things in the universe and theories of relativity and all things Einstein and how we as little humans live in this vast universe. And early on in this conversation, he's being, there's a reporter talking to him. He says this, well, the truth of all this is the universe doesn't care. And the reporter asks, well, what do you mean? The stars in the sky, they don't know about us. We'll never know if anybody's living there or not, probably. And eventually, in a billion years, there will be no life here on Earth because the sun will warm up and boil away all the oceans and the human race will be forgotten. So. In the far, far fullness of time, nothing will remain. And there's the long pause. And you're thinking, well, welcome to church. Okay, here we are. <laughs> and then the reporter asked this question. Does being the cosmic correspondent make you depressed? <laughs> and, he, and he responds, he says, does it make me depressed? And she says, well, what we're all thinking, she says, because what you just said, that sounds very grim. And he pauses again. It's really awkward. And he says, um, I, I'm not depressed right now, but I guess, I guess I'm, I'm always depressed. And then there's 20 more minutes of that, like that interview. I mean, they went into all kinds of other things from there. But I'm listening to that. And of course, I'm, you, you all know me well enough who, who know me. I want to scream into the interview. Like, I'm, I'm guessing this guy, Overby, now he, he's, he's an atheist. So he's landed just like where every other super smart atheist has ever landed. If you're honest, if there is no God, there is no purpose, there is no meaning to life, you might, I might as well just die right now. I mean, let me go out at least on my own terms. That's where it goes. And I thought, I bet you he's never read Romans 1, where Paul says they've exchanged the truth of God for a lie and they've worshiped and served the creature or the created more than the creator. What Paul is saying is, it's not that even atheists, it's not that we don't worship. We can't not worship. Everybody worships something. So the Bible calls gods or idols. And we all worship because God has planted within us this knowledge that he exists. Again, Romans 1. Gosh, Ecclesiastes. He's planted eternity in the hearts of men and women. We know that he exists. There's this homing device in us that's running after him unless we want to keep on pushing him out of our lives. But for people to think they don't worship something or someone, John Calvin's the one who said, the human heart is a perpetual idol-making factory. And what I want you to think with me about today is what are your idols? What are your gods? This has been so helpful for me. I've referenced Jean-Paul Sartre, the great French philosopher, who said, if there is no absolute truth, there's no, no authority outside of us, ultimately, if there is no God, and he was an atheist as well, he said, then man is damned to be free, condemned to be free. Meaning, 
Now it's up to you. You determine what your identity is. No outside source is going to tell you that. You determine what the meaning of your life is. Carry the burden. You figure out what the purpose of life is and where it's going. And that always leads down a rabbit troll, a rabbit hole of, of anxiety. He says that is a recipe for a life of anxiety. And I've said it here because it's hard to be God is why. And so what we've been doing here is unpacking this thing of freedom. What does it mean to be free? You ask a group of your contemporaries at work or in your neighborhood or wherever, you ask them to define freedom, people will usually go, gather a group of teenagers. What is freedom? And they generally will go and imagine, they imagine the absence of restraint. Absence of limitations. That's freedom. And frankly, we all go there in certain aspects or areas of our lives. What we've said from the start is a countercultural, radical truth. From the very start of this series, freedom is not found in doing whatever you want to do. Freedom is found in doing what you, everybody, ought to do. Oughtness demands a God because right and wrong, that's where it goes, to ultimate good, who determines what is good and what is bad and what we ought to do. And here's the twist. If freedoms do whatever you want to do, but you can't do what you ought to do, that's not freedom. That's bondage. And that's what the book of Galatians really is about. And Paul has been on repeat. If you've been here at all, read the book. I challenge you to do so. You can read it this afternoon in no time. Read it again because he's saying you're justified by faith, not by works. And that sounds real religious kind of language. We're all trying to justify ourselves. We're trying to validate our existence. We're trying to justify the reason we live. Every minute of every day. We've done it this morning. I'm going I'm to justify that my life matters. And I want people to know that my life matters and that I am something. And I'm, I'm somebody and I, I matter, don't I? True freedom is found when you're when you're released of that burden and you realize that you are justified by faith, not by your works, anything you do, position, power, anything you own, but instead you're justified by God and what he has said about you and what he's already done for you. And so if you were with us last week in the first part of chapter four, go ahead and turn to uh, Galatians four. That's where we're going to be. Galatians four, uh, last week, one through seven we, uh, we saw that Paul likened immaturity to slavery, if you were here. Maturity is really freedom. And then here's the ironic twist. It's kind of what I've noted already this morning. Freedom is actually not independence. Freedom is dependence. Freedom is dependence on God. That's where freedom is found, where we can live as we ought to live. So I'm going to look at, he keeps on going with this argument. Um, and in verse 8 through 11, will serve as a primary text for us. I won't walk through in the entire chapter, it's a lot. But uh, verses 8 through 11 serve as really the outline, I think, for the rest of, for his next analogy, his next story that he's going to tell, as he's been doing, to make his point that we're justified by faith, not anything you do. Verse 8, formally... When you did not know God, you were enslaved to those that by nature are not gods. But now that you have come to know God, or rather, here's the great phrase, to be known by God, how can you turn back again to the weak and worthless elementary principles of this world, rudimentary principles, he's already used this phrase, of the world. We're going to talk about that whose slaves you want to be once more. You observe days and months and seasons and years. These are pagan holidays. The Jews had their own as well. I am afraid I may have labored over you in vain. Paul is really troubled. And I've noticed as the letter goes on, he gets, he's getting more and more upset. Because as if he's writing it down or an amanuensis, he's thinking through it and he's going, I, they're making me crazy. What they have done, they've turned away from grace and to be justified by faith and they're going back to the law after having been set free. Like we've already sung about today. So powerful. And he says they're going back to religion on the one hand, you could call it, but he says that it's the elementary principles of this world. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. He's saying. 
So three questions I want you to see in these few verses. Who are the not gods, okay? How do they enslave us? And how does the gospel set us free? And I'm gonna challenge you to do something. I'm gonna get you inside my head and heart on, on a personal level, but how I wrestle with gods and idols in my own life and how we can overcome. Because the goal, once justified, is to be sanctified, become just like Jesus. And it starts in the heart, starts in the mind. So in verse eight, he says, you didn't know God, and now you're enslaved, or you, you were enslaved by, na- by those that are by nature not God. So this is really interesting, isn't it? So wait, we worship those that are not even gods? You know, there's only one God, right? There are evil forces, spiritual forces in the world. They were pagan, these are pagan Gentiles. And before they knew God, he's saying, you're under the authority of other gods in your life. Something else was driving you, though they're not gods. You're either gonna worship the true God or you're gonna be under the authority of other gods in your life. And he's speaking to Christians, don't miss this. We're all prone to go back to this, is what he's saying to us here. So who are the not gods, right? Who are the gods, who are the not gods? The not gods are idols. They're elementary or rudimentary spirits of this world. Stokia is the Greek word. Uh, it's, a, it's a word that really means, one commentator said, it's the ABCs of the universe. We've talked about this uh, a couple times here. Um, it's, it's a primal way to live. It's cause and effect, if you will. I do this, you do that. You bring it over to religion, I do this, God does this. As if he's some kind of, you know, cosmic vending machine or the, the cosmic Amazon man. I click this, you bring this. I do this, you do that. He says, that is rudimentary, elementary. Notice he doesn't say elementary principles of religion. He says of the world. He's not saying that Christianity now has come along and it's a superior religion to all religions. He's saying, no, it's not a religion altogether. It's a third way. The gospel is always another way because some are seeking uh, to justify themselves through their good works. Others through really licentiousness or even pagan gods. And he's saying, okay, the stokia, here's his point. This stokia, okay, the elementary principle of the world is the God behind every God, is what he's saying. It's paganism, worshiping the created, not the creator, back to Romans 1. And he says, that, and see, anything can be a God. So if you come to God, think about this. If you come to God and say, I wanna, I wanna learn how to worship you. The first thing he's gonna point out to you is how not to worship. He's gonna point out that there is idol worship going on. You're already worshiping. He doesn't say, well, now you can start worshiping. You're already worshiping. And so all of us need to identify our gods and idols in our lives. It's interesting, in 1 John, uh, the, the book of 1 John, chapter five, it ends, this book is all about living in the light, living in love, being a holy person, being sanctified like Jesus. And then he ends the book, John ends the entire book, last verse, with this, little children, Keep yourselves from idols. Full stop. Like, okay, anything more? Keep yourself from idols. Because he's summarizing everything that he said throughout the book. Keep yourself from idols, and it's the word for us today. All of scripture tells us the greatest hindrance to life is not, hang with me, deeds and actions, but it's always saying the greatest danger uh, And the reason behind all that we do is idolatry. And the reason that we enter into sin is because we're not worshiping the one true God in the moment. And so let's unpack this. Okay, I'm gonna spend some time on this first first point. Who are the not gods? Because this has helped me so much in my spiritual life. When you fail to be like Jesus, when you fall into sin, a lot of us aren't nearly as aware as we should be, living lives of confession constantly. But if you were to run down the Ten Commandments even, simply, why are you lying? Why are you stealing? And Jesus, of course, then redefined, why are you committing adultery? Why do you lust? Why do you covet? Why do you want that thing? Why do you compare yourself to that person? Why are you hating someone? Why are you angry towards that person? It's because something is an idol. See, when you fail, when you sin, you need to ask, what is it in place of God that, I'm, that I have placed within my heart that's making me do this. I don't ask simply, don't do that, or don't say, don't do that, I gotta stop doing that, I gotta stop doing that, I'm gonna do better. This is moralism that can either lead to pride or just constant condemnation. 
because you can't live up to even what you would like to be and become, right? What is it besides God that has captured my heart? And it can be, in fact, as you will know, often a very good thing. Good things will make God things. That's what idols are. And you can imagine how insidious this is for a minister type. All that I'm doing is for God. Right? I've discovered not always. Because even for me, a, a ministry can become a God. You know, what, you know what idol I run to the most? This isn't just mass confession. Your pastor. I want to be a great pastor. I want to be all that you deserve. And when I can't, when I, when I'm, you know, when I get fearful, anxious, I realize that's, that's my God. And the Lord said, Jeff, differentiate yourself. I love you. You're my son. That's who you are. You're not a pastor. I can do this without you. I love you. You just do what you do and how I've gifted you. Stop being so anxious or worried or fearful. I've got this. And I'm reminded, right? Oh, that's right. This is your church. It's not my church. You're the head of the church. An idol is anything that occupies my heart in the place of God. Anything, how about this? Anything you think about a lot. I would argue any, the thing you think about the most is your idol. It's your God. You say, well, Jeff, I think a lot about my work. Bam. I think a lot about my girlfriend. Yes. Generally run to, that's the other idol in my life, likely, is my wife, Stacy. I just want to, I want to serve her. I want to, I want to worship her. I want to, my life centers around her. Or, or how about this, my, chip, my family, my, my grandson now. Can he be an idol? You bet. Whatever captures our hearts, Augustine said it this way. This is so important to understand. Sin is not simply uh, running after evil things. Most of us can spot that. And a lot of us here, we're rather moral people, or so we think we are. Augustine defines sin as love out of order. And we've talked about this a little bit. Good things become God things. And that's where most of us fall. We, we've been, you know, we're going to get into Galatians 5 um, and next, next week. And in two weeks, we're going to end up at Galatians 5.16. Hang with me here. Because here's where he talks about walking in the Spirit. He says, keep in step with the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In fact, Megan, who read earlier, uh, same word in the passage she read earlier, desires. And the word is epithumia. Now, this is really important. In in the Greek, this, this word is used over and over again throughout most books in the New Testament. And we often translate it as lust, to have a lust, a desire. It's often translated lust. So we run to sex. But it's much more than that. It actually means over-desire. Like epi, the prefix, means over or on or upon. Like an epicenter of an earthquake is the point, the the greatest intensity of of desire is your uber-over-desire. That's what it means. It's the over-desire that you have for especially really good things. We run to good things and we place those things in, in place of God. And that's why people upset us. That's why your spouse makes a lousy God. And why you're often upset, maybe with friends or people that you think ought to come through for you, you have placed them as gods perhaps in your life. And most often our gods become our identities. That's where we find our identity. And, and so what happens is, here's what I wanna guide you with. This is what's helped me so much. Our identities lead us to chains, okay, that enslave us. And to follow the chain uh, will lead you to your idol. And on the end of the chain, often there's a rabid dog and he's eating you alive. But the chain, watch this, the chain is your deepest emotions. And most of us don't think deeply about this. We don't think deeply enough of how Christ is formed in us. We have to remove these idols for God to take his place in in our lives. When you find yourself in sin, especially habitual sin, look at the chain, follow it, and it'll lead you to your idol. And your chain is your deepest emotion. You need to ask yourself, here's an application this week. And then, you know, like, let's say I'm going about my life. 
Uh, I got a low grade frustration today. What is going on there? Why is that? I, I've got a low grade anger. This undercurrent of anger in my, in my life, and I've learned to control it. I'm not going to just freak out on everybody. But why am I, why am I impatient today? Why am I impatient with that person in particular? What am I afraid of? Often frustration is, I, I'm, I'm afraid that I'm losing something here. And you're standing in the way of it. See, this is where we stop. Most of us don't go deeper than that. And we personify our challenges. I'll tell you I'm angry because of that person. They make me angry. I'll tell you I'm impatient. My kids are crazy. That's why I'm messed up here. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. Oh, you want to be super parent. Is that an idol? You see how this plays out? We've got to learn to go deeper. Questions like, what do I think I'm losing? It's making me so fearful and, and anxious. And, and, why, and if people are honest around me, why does everybody think I'm, I'm a little crazy? Because anxiety begets anxiety. And fear leads us then to anger and people who are standing in our way and we're bumping up against each other. See, often our idols are revealed through anger, frustration, loss, grief. But we got to learn. Spirit, teach me. Show me. And here's the thing. Your ability, your position, your place where you have power, this will be your identity and it becomes an idol. So he says in verse 9, but now that you have come to know God, rather be known by God, how can you turn back to these worthless things? Like, do you really want to keep living this way to become a slave to it all? He's bewildered. And see, here's the thing that's interesting. Irreligious and religious people do this. Atheists and committed Christians do this. We fall into it ourselves, not as much, certainly. But, but it's, it's when, we, when we think by religion and good works, moralism, I'm going to be somebody. Even that can become an idol, a god. And God's going, you, you worship me or you, you're just doing the thing? Because you've, you've eliminated me, actually. That's self-salvation, right? Absent God. The other is, well, I'm just going to live the way I want to live. Licentiousness. And I'll, I'll choose my own gods and I'll go after it and I should find myself out there. This is the story of the prodigal son, isn't it? The younger son, the way of irreligion, freedom, independence, whatever you want to do, the older son stays, he's obedient to the father, doing all the things, keeping the law, if you will, and he's miserable. Neither of them want the father. They only want what the father can give them. They're looking, they, they may not explain it that way, as, as many would not. They say, I'm just looking for happiness is what I'm looking for, which we now have defined as pleasure in our culture. But think about this, C central to idol worship, is, is the fact that we need to understand that worship is not simply an event, but a lifestyle. You think about the first two commandments of the 10. So the first one is what? Anybody? You shall what? Have no other gods before me. The second one is what? I mean, these are big, y'all. These are really important. <laughs> these are really important. These are important. At some point, I've said it as a Christian, you got to read your Bible. You have to read the Bible. It's, it's key. Um, okay, don't, I know there's different ways to say that. Don't make any graven images, right? And it says, above the earth, on the earth, below the earth. Don't make a God, an idol, out of anything. Because you are prone to worship, you're going to run to those things, and an idol is anything that absorbs your heart. You see this? So what happens is, every other command... All of the other commands, three through 10, and then every other command and sin that we commit is because we're not following the first two commandments. Every, uh, every one of the others follow. And so this desire, okay, this epithumia shows us this. Sin is not a normal desire for evil things. Can be that. It's more often an over-desire for good things. Things that we make God things. Idol worship is the first barrier to true worship. And we've got to get our minds around this. This is what Paul's saying. Look at verse 10. 
You observe days and months and seasons and years and saying, you've, you've done all the religious things you've done, and I'm afraid I've just labored in vain. This is heartbreaking. It's, it's the heart of a pastor. It's the heart of a parent. Any one of us who've loved someone who maybe wants to walk with God and then they've turned away. He said, I can't. And then he says, brothers and sisters, I entreat you, become as I am. Meaning, I'm free now. For I also have become as you are. You did me no wrong. He said, don't do me wrong now. And then he goes on to explain, for the sake of time, verse 13. When I first met you all, um, I you know, had this bodily ailment. A lot of people think it's, oh, he had an eye problem or something like that. And uh, he said, you, you brought me in. You cared for me. And this is when he shared the gospel under distress. And then in verse 15, what's become of your blessedness? He's saying, where's the love? Where's the love now? Because you would have gouged out your eyes. Maybe another reference to to an eye problem. Verse 16, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? He's saying, what I'm trying to do is keep you focused on the gospel of free grace, nothing else. Truth offends people is what he's saying here. And it's true in our life because the truth is confrontational. You will never grow apart from truth in your life because truth confronts our beliefs, our attitudes, our motives. So what truth is he talking about here? What is he talking about? Well, it's the truth of the gospel and how the gospel sets us free, okay? So who are these not gods? How do they enslave us? We've talked about. Now, how does the gospel free us? And we'll close with this. He says, well, in verse nine, well, you have come now to know God, but even, even more, uh, God knows you. And he's saying, this is preemptive love. God's the initiator. He knows everything about you. Consider this, to be fully known and fully loved at the same time. This is the love of God for you. This is the cry of the human heart. And it's what we long for in relationships and we find it in Christ. And then he goes through the rest of this chapter by talking about Abraham's relationship with Sarah and Hagar, how Hagar had a son, Ishmael. You might remember that Abraham uh, and Sarah concocted a plan. She's not having a baby. We got to get on with this thing because God's promised this. So we're going to, he sleeps with Hagar, has a son named Ishmael. Uh, We've got a son of promise. Bam. Here we go. God's fulfilled his promise. And God says, except that wasn't my plan. I've already told you what my plan is. So then Isaac comes along 13 years later. He goes on to explain that now you, in verse 28, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of the promise. You're not, not, don't, don't, don't try to be like Ishmael. In verse 29, but just as at the time he was born according to the flesh, persecuted him, the one born according to the flesh, persecuted him who's born of the spirit. That is Isaac, born of the flesh, Ishmael. And he's saying here, there was a time when Ishmael, the older, by 13 years older, was abusing, teasing uh, the younger, Isaac. Sarah comes to Abraham and then God comes to him and says the same thing, which is in the next uh, verse there, 30. But what does the scripture say? You can see this in Genesis 21. Cast out the slave woman and her son. For the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. And sure enough, he was. Abraham says, you're gone. And and Ishmael was his firstborn son. And so like those who've gone before us, how about Jacob, the younger, receiving the birthright instead of Esau? Or how about Abel's offering, the younger, being received, not Cain's? We follow in a long line of people who do not deserve the birthright, who have not been heirs of anything. And he says, now because of Christ, You have received the promise of salvation through Jesus Christ by faith, not by works. Abraham, Isaac was all about faith. Ishmael was all about, let's do it our way. And he's saying, don't go back to that. Be free in Christ. Listen, this is a story of grace. Not because of your birth order, not because of your good works, not because you're an amazing Christian or anything else. Not because you got what was coming to you. What was coming to us was condemnation, hell, and eternity apart from God. That's what's coming to every person outside of Christ. We only come to him by faith. So he says in verse 31, so brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. He's kind of like who you want your mama to be. 
And then in verse 1 of chapter 5, he says, It's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Friends, brothers and sisters, with the passion of Paul, I'm telling you, stop going back. Identify your idols and come at them with the truth of God's word. He says that you are loved, you've been set free. If you have received his gift of grace. And if you haven't, or if you've got questions about it, you need to settle that today. Because there is a God. And in a billion years from now, those who know him will continue to worship him. We will find ourselves on a new earth, and a new heaven, worshiping a resurrected Savior forever and ever. And after a billion years, we have, will have only just begun. Praise be to God. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for this truth that you've given to us, the truth of your grace. And a reminder that you are God and that you're in control. And right now, Lord, I pray for those who are here um, in this divine moment, uh, Lord, that you would, having touched their hearts, I pray for those who need to receive your grace right now. And friend, right now, I just want to prompt you, all, all of us praying for anyone who's, who's lost, has never received your grace. I want to challenge you. You can receive his grace right now. By faith, just pray, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. I'm sorry for how I have sought after other gods. I turn to you, the one true God, to give me life and purpose. I die to myself, and I give you my life as an act of worship, to live for you. And Lord, for the rest of us, having been justified, friend, I want to ask you, have you made an intentional decision to be sanctified? What are you doing to become just like Jesus? Lord, we love you. We thank you for your grace today. We go now set free to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.